I want you to turn to Jeremiah 2, verse 13. The great prophet Jeremiah, known as the weeping prophet, because he was there in the last days of the southern kingdom before the Babylonian captivity and before it the destruction of Jerusalem and Solomon's temple. And he's letting them know that all this is coming upon you as punishment for your long years of disobedience to God. There's nothing you can do about it. It's God's will that's happening. And I'll go to verse 13 in just a moment, but this was all happening about 600 years before Christ. And I think you can say that the southern kingdom, to say the best about it, was facing very hard times. The northern kingdom of Israel had been taken away into Assyrian captivity. They didn't exist as an entity there anymore. And two very wicked kings, Manasseh and Amnon, had carried Judah, the southern kingdom of Judah, into deeper depths of idolatry. All sorts of things that attended with idolatrous people they were engaged in. Following those two kings, a young king came to the throne by the name of Josiah, son and grandson of Manasseh and Amnon. And he struggled to do what was right and to lead Judah back to God under the law of Moses. In the 13th year of Josiah's reign, God called a young priest to be a prophet. And when you get into Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, you learn that his name was Jeremiah. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, the priests that were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Amnon, or Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. It's interesting to note that in his first work that God commanded for him to do was that he was to deliver a very important message to Jerusalem. Now you might understand in that society where young people were very quiet, stood out of the way when the older people spoke, that he was hesitant as a young man to speak. If you look in verse 6, he said, Then said I, ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But that didn't phase God, if you want to use that kind of terminology. God knew he could do what he called him to do because he's God and he knows the man better than the man knows himself. So he recalls, first of all, in Jeremiah chapter 2, that is the prophet, the past faithfulness of Judah. Over the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness in a land that was not sown, Israel was holiness unto the Lord in the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. There was his approach in reminding them, and you cannot help but say, well, what happened? Well, after he bemoans the apostasy of the as the Bible sometimes refers to it as the elder sister Israel, and he then does so concerning the sins of Jacob or Judah because they 
turn to idols and all the attendant sins with it. And in turning to them, they left the one true and living God. And he spends from verse 4 all the way through verse 11 pointing that out. In other words, this is happening to you because you brought it up on yourself. You have nobody to blame but yourself. If you look over in the New Testament, you will find as Stephen was preaching and gave, a, you might say, he, he covered all of the history of Israel. You'll see that he referred to how that Israel had treated the prophets. Verse 52 of Acts chapter 7, Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? They have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Interesting that the response of the people all these hundreds of years later when Stephen preached is the same as the people at the time of Jeremiah and for hundreds of years before that. Here's what it said of the response of those who heard Stephen. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. That's getting pretty mad when you're gritting your teeth at somebody that, because you can't stand what they're saying. No indication there of being pricking their heart and crying out unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, in this case Stephen, men and brethren, what shall we do? And so it was with the prophets of old as they labored to call Israel to walk in the old path. Now what's interesting is that Jeremiah called for the heavens to take on an astonishment. It's always interesting to watch how the prophets do this. As if the whole, they personify the heavens, in other words. Behold what's happening. See what they're doing. And the heavens uh, look on in astonishment and in great fear as God lays these accusations at the feet of those who are guilty of them. And this brings us to our text. Verse 12 of chapter 2, Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord. Why? For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. And herein is to be found in our sermon, the lessons that I want us to get. What have they done? They had forsaken their God, the very source of living water. Now when you think of living water, you're thinking of springs bubbling forth from the earth, or fountains, running water. Lively water, aerated water, as opposed to a still pool of possibly water in some form of stagnation. That's the first thing they did. Two evils, and there's the first one. And the next one was hewing for themselves broken cisterns that can hold no water. In rocky countries where especially it's uh, very dry as it was there and still is, they would literally hew out of the rock, tanks we would call it, and it would catch in the rainy season the runoff of the rain. But of course this was not coming from a viable fountain, was it? it would begin to stagnate the longer it was there. It would still be usable. But nevertheless, it wasn't the effervescence, if you want to call it that, of the bubbling springs of fresh water. And besides that, in this case, they hewed out these cisterns and they had holes in them. And it would hold water anyway. 
So at best, they would have some kind of still stagnant water, but it didn't make any difference. They got cracks in them, and the water that's there runs out, and that's what you've done to yourself. So when they left God, the living water, then they hewed out cisterns, but they were broken. So no water was in them of any kind. Now this raises a question for us, spiritual Israel. Could we be guilty of the evil of those same evils today? Or like evils? And sadly, the answer is yes, because whatsoever things were written the fourth time were written for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. To see how this can be done, then we need to give maybe greater attention to these two great evils spoken of by the prophet Jeremiah 2.13. Notice again, forsaking the fountain of living waters. Well, before this, you know, Israel had forsaken God. Judah didn't benefit from that. As the prophet called Israel, that's your elder sister. And what did you learn from her? Nothing. You're doing just exactly what she did. All of you were delivered from Egyptian bondage by the providential care of God, Jeremiah 2 and verse 6. All of you were led through the wilderness wanderings and taken care of, Jeremiah 2, 6, while even the shoes they had never wore out. They were delivered into the land flowing with milk and honey, Jeremiah 2, and verse 7. Now, it is true that everybody 20 years old and upward who left Egypt died in the wilderness, save Caleb and Joshua. But even that was a great lesson for the remnant that came out of Egypt to have learned from. And when you read the beginning of Joshua, the end of Deuteronomy, and you see all these marvelous promises, we will never forsake you, we will never forsake you, we will never forsake you, and Moses says, but you will. But you will. Even prophesies of what will transpire when you do. Even telling them, yeah, you say you won't, and you, you're very plain about that, but you will. And here's what's going to happen. And thus, we move into the period of time of Joshua. The elders who outlived Joshua, and they were faithful. But then those that rose not knowing, they immediately depart into idolatry. And so begins the sordid, sad history of Israel down until Assyria takes the northern kingdom into captivity and Babylon does the same for the southern kingdom. But there's one thing that stands out. God was always true to His word to Israel and to Judah. Always true to His word. He kept every promise. He violated not one of them. Israel simply forgot her God. Beginning with her own priests, if you look in verse 8, you'll see that brought out. And when the priest who offer sacrifices for the people are corrupted, how do the people worship? How can they approach God since the Levitical priesthood was the way they approach God? And, of course, that confounded everything. And from one generation to the next, they constantly followed the pattern of apostasy, Jeremiah 2 and verse 9. Listen to how it reads. Wherefore I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. You know, it's always something we don't think about, but Rarely do a, does a generation of people depart from God without affecting the next generation. And it compounds as you know through the years. From one generation to the next, they continue to leave God. Now what's interesting, they were unlike the pagan idolatrous nations. 
Have you noticed when you're reading through the Old Testament that those pagan adulterous nations never left their gods? Have you ever noticed that? They never left false gods, no gods. But Israel left the one true and living God who fulfilled every promise ever made to them, who provided for them, who gave ample evidence and then some to prove he was who he was. And they left him over and over again. You can see that in verse 10. For pass over the isles of Chittim and see and send them to Kedar and consider diligently and see if there be such a thing. Hath the nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods, but my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. Be astonished. And this is where we're back to our text. O ye heavens of this, be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord. Israel changed their glory, who was God, the fountain of living waters, into that which did not profit. Jeremiah 2, 11, the last part of verse 11. But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. Now the question is to me as a child of God, still knowing that the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom may devour, I'm in Satan's sights. So is every other member of the Lord's church. Now, don't think about those who are totally apostate. He once knew him but denied him and are caught up in sins and they're going about their own way. Or those outside of Christ. Satan already has them. He already has them. What he wants is you. And the question you must ask honestly as God reviews your mind now, is he making any headway with you? That's the question we have to ask all our life. It's part of our efforts to examine ourselves honestly and objectively in the light of the right and divided word to see whether we are in the faith or out. It's not something you do once and quit. It's a constant thing. Will we forsake our fountain? We have our fountain of living waters. Remember, Jesus promised during his earthly ministry to the Samaritan woman, the waters that when you drink you'll never thirst again, John 4, 13-14. And said it's available to everybody who believes on him. John 7, verses 37 through 39. And it's interesting that Jesus later revealed the same thing to the beloved Apostle John. Regarding our state between death and the resurrection. And also regarding our eternal destiny in the new Jerusalem. If we enjoy the living waters here through faithful obedience of the gospel and constant adherence thereto and being steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, then it's not in vain. We will have heaven. And that's what we have for us. All because Jesus is the fountain of living waters. There we forget God. Who through Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, and the revelation of His Spirit offers us spiritual life, a fountain of living waters, a fountain springing up unto, into everlasting life, as it's said in John 4 and verse 14. Rivers of living water flowing from our hearts, John 7 and verse 38. Who through Jesus and His Spirit promises an afterlife of eternal life and glory. It's only through the living water. You see how it ties in with the shadow and types of the Old Testament. That when Israel and Judah forsook the fountain of living waters, it had meaning to us today in the church as Christ truly offers the living waters of full forgiveness of sin and reconciliation to God. But we're free moral agents. We can still give it all up. The world can still be more important to us. A person doesn't have to be a murderer or a thief or a fornicator or an adulterer or a homosexual, some character like that, to lose his soul. Just let the world be more important to you than your involvement in the kingdom of heaven. There we labor. I think sometimes we do ourselves a great disservice to try to focus on the murderers and people like that as if they're the only ones going to heaven. And yet look at every judgment parable Jesus gave. 
And Jesus consigns those people to eternal damnation for they left undone what God required of them. When you get through with evil and you give it up, you repent of it, and you turn away from it, there is something to do. There's something you replace evil works with, the good works that have to do with faithful service to God. How much are we involved in those things? There's a pure water of life proceeding from the throne of heaven, is, or the throne of God in heaven, as John pictures it in Revelation 22.1. In order to get to that, in the great glory of heaven by and by, we must partake of the water of life here. And that's faithful service to God. Beginning by being baptized into Christ as a believer that's repented of sins and confessed his faith in Christ that we might be in the blood-bought body. We face a real possibility of departing from the living God simply through sins of omission. We just simply don't do what we should do. Forsaking our fountain of living water occurs when we whatever they may be, substitute our broken cisterns that promise but do not deliver. Now consider what Judah had done. Hewed cisterns that held no water. They trusted in themselves, what they could create. Israel had her broken cisterns. They had turned completely to the whole pantheon of, of gods and the Baal family, and that's what they were. If you go study about some places call it Baal, then you'll see there was a whole system of those gods, you know, system or people, beings that were they called gods, whole family. False prophets who spoke in the name of Baal were everywhere, Jeremiah 2.8. They embraced all of that, departed from God, the law of Moses. False, there was a false sense of uh, prosperity, now, what's interesting is that God had forewarned about all of that. In Moses' restatement of the law, just before the children of Israel went into the land of Canaan in Deuteronomy 8, 11 through 17. And if you look at Jeremiah 2 and verse 6, neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through the land of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought and of the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through and where no man dwelt? They just simply forgot who brought them to where they were. They were insignificant people. They were nothing but a bunch of slaves. And God says, I took you as if you were a child just born and thrown out in the ditch. Cleaned you up, nourished you, and brought you to where you are. And how do you treat me? So there's materialism, all kinds of immorality that's engulfed those people. All of that stemming from idolatry because those things were attendant in the worship of false gods. But we can be guilty of heeding false prophets too. Peter, remember of inspiration of the Spirit in 2 Peter 2 uh, verses 1 through 3, he said, as there were false prophets among the people, there shall be among us. And you can see all around us denominationalism, sectarianism, and such stuff as that. They all give God lip service, but they don't submit to His authority. They don't know, really, what is Christianity. Contrary to Jesus' prayer and the unity of the Spirit, John 17, 20 and 21, and what we've studied in Ephesians 4, 3 through 6, they neglect it. They don't have a unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And yet we must have it or we can't be what God says you ought to be in order for heaven to be your home. Others who offer false hopes are all around us, influencing us. The New Agers and the false religions of every kind. And there's all kinds of people that are offering you every kind of get-rich-quick schemes. Many of them religious people. And we can be guilty of a sense of prosperity. Sometimes one of the greatest ways the devil has of getting us is to make us be happy in, in our fat. <laughs> I guess that's one way to put it. <laughs> because we have such blessings that nobody else in this world knows about. We worry about the people wanting to come across the border. Why do they want to come across the border? 
I don't want to do that. What's here that makes them want to come? I don't see that happening in India or China, places like that. Why here? Well, because we have such that the world is not known for the most part, and people want part of it. We believe we have such that can't be taken from us, but it can be. We think also in our materialism we're secure. And we think sometimes we're spiritually mature when we trust in the wrong things. And when you look at 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12, he who thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. We can be guilty of leaving God for a poor substitute of true religion and trusting in things that are fleeting. Adam Clark, in his commentary, describes the two evils committed by Israel. First, they forsook God, the fountain of life, light, prosperity, and happiness. Then he says, secondly, they hewed out broken cisterns. They joined themselves to idols from whom they could receive neither temporal nor spiritual good. Their conduct was the excess of folly and blindness. That sound familiar? How much more would it be an excess of folly and blindness for us today to forsake God, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, all that's holy, and neglect our devotions to God, obedient to His Word in every fast of life. In other words, to spend more time drinking from broken cisterns, trying to get the last dregs that haven't run out the crack yet, teaching for traditions, or teaching for <coughs> commandments, the traditions of men. When there's the fountain of living water, the living Word of God. Now you say, but we're members of the church. If we're members of the church, it's because we receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls and we tenaciously hold on to it to be faithful and just give it up in any area and we start the process that started long ago in Israel and brought them to the terrible end. I hope these unfortunate people in Judah written four time for our learning will serve as a warning to all of us in spiritual Israel as to where we ought to get our water. And may we ever be open to the wonderful and marvelous and great invitation extended at the end of the book of Revelation. Revelation twenty two seventeen, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. The question I have to ask always for myself, should be of every Christian. Are you drinking of the water of life? Or are you drinking from broken cisterns that can hold no water? And every day of your life, as you search in detail into your life, this is general, as you search in detail in your life as to your obligations to God as a precious child of God, I have to ask those questions. And I don't want to be guilty of committing the two evils that Judah of old did. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, we urge you to believe in Christ and obey the gospel by being baptized into Him, to live faithful to God, as a child of God, what if everybody lived on the same level you lived in your study of the Bible, your prayers, your working with the church, your fellowship of your brethren? What would the church, church be worth? What would it accomplish? And yet that's the way we ought to look at it. Each one of us, according to our several abilities, putting all we've got into it, and together we make a great army of the Lord. And that's the way the Lord intended it. And our everyday influence for good around everybody we are around. That's our goal. As a child of God, have you slipped? What are you drinking out of? In view of our lesson. If you need to repent, we invite you to do so while we stand and sing.